I feel like I have a lot to talk about with myself after yesterday's dialogue with myself. And yesterday's dialogue was mainly spurred on by watching that webinar on self-directed funding. And I felt really excited about it. And I still do, but I've realized that Getting excited about self-directed funding is something that is outside of my circle of influence. I read the book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, a number of years ago. It's by Stephen Covey, I think. And I remember him talking about one circle of concern and one circle of influence. So the self-directed funding is within my circle of concern, but it's not something I can directly influence, besides maybe letting people know about it a bit or sending a few emails to certain people, but it's not really going to do that much. That is more the system that has to take that on. And I also was saying that I've sort of been doing a self-directed thing without having self-directed funding, so I don't want to start framing my dialogue with myself in terms of self-direction. I've been calling it self-dialogue and embody one's mania, which could be the same in a way, partially, as self-direction or have similar elements. So I'm going to continue to use my own language and maybe throw self-direction in there, here and there. I really don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm just telling myself now that don't get too excited about the system's languaging of things because it's just outside my direct influence. What I can influence is my dialogue with myself and and what I talk about moving forward and also what I choose to embody. And I've talked a lot about embodiment, yet I guess I've embodied certain things. I've embodied somebody coming off their meds and and I haven't really embodied that which I would embody as a person who is no longer on meds, who's gone through all of this stuff in the system. And now I'm somewhat free. And I remember talking about how after my crisis in January, and I was able to manage it at home without going to the hospital, by taking extra Seroquel and things, I felt kind of free. I felt free to not always be near a hospital in my hometown, in my home country. And that gave me the confidence to go to California knowing that I could control that situation or or do something about that situation if it happened. And it did happen. And then I took extra Seroquel and then that spurred me on to deciding to come off meds now as opposed to when I go back home. Because I didn't see giving myself extra drugs all the time as an option, I saw it as, okay, these drugs aren't working anymore, it's time to try something else. And I took that risk. So I didn't think that I would have a chance to be a person off medication until after I was home for, say, two or three months. But this means I'm months ahead of schedule. So I've been wanting to embody a person who is not needing to take toxic drugs, and I'm actually doing that. So then what, what comes out of that? And I don't really know. And so this talking about it isn't to say I know what it's going to be. It's just talking about possibilities. And also I'm feeling like perhaps I will talk for the next 10 days about stuff related to this self-direction and read some stuff that I wrote to mental health systems and things. And then perhaps try to let it go by the 20th of June, which is my one year anniversary of the initial one year mark I set for myself. And that is actually the beginning of the playlist that I've put together. So, because that was, that was actually the first videos that I actually edited. I was talking and then I would edit it. So before that I made a few videos and I didn't edit them. I just talked the whole way through. So it's kind of arbitrary, but I'm seeing that June 20th as a possible opportunity to shift the conversation with myself. And it's already been shifting anyways, but whatever. I've often set little 
timelines for myself and not followed them. And that goes both ways. I've set the timeline of going off meds when I get home and I've already gone off the meds. So even if I don't stop talking about mental health stuff by the 20th, and not completely, just focusing on some of these things that I have no control over, but I still want to talk about. But can I shift more into things I do have control over, like what I would embody next, as well as creating new language around moving away and ensuring that I won't fall back into the mental health system, as well as language that is just completely devoid of referring to mental health at all. And perhaps one day I will reside in that languaging and in that sort of interpretation, even though life isn't an interpretation, but using words is an interpretation of that. So will I interpret that energy without having to refer to mental health because I'm not having any of those kinds of experiences? And maybe I am, but maybe I just have a completely different language. And the language we use around certain energies and experiences actually frames how we experience them. So if I do have further experience and I'm able to create language even further away from mental health, and I say further away from mental health, but what I really mean is into something else, into something else completely, because even saying further away from mental health is still a reaction to the mental health system. And it might take a little while to get that out of my system, and that's okay. So even talking to myself now, I'm kind of reframing and seeing those energies that are still holding on to this dialogue. And I talked about before how in my early 20s I had chronic fatigue syndrome, and that's all I'd think about, and that's all I'd talk about, and that's what I would talk about with other people if they're asking what was going on for me and, and sharing my journey with that. And then eventually... I might talk about it once a year. So how long will it take for me to talk about mental health once a year? And maybe if I continue to participate in change in that dimension, I will continue to talk about it more. But maybe not. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. And that's the other thing I was thinking is, in my last conversation with myself, I was talking kind of like I want to go back and get into participating in system change in some way. But I'm wondering if I even dip my toe in it, even look at it or even contemplate going back to it, can dipping my toe in the mental health system, not even in terms of wanting to participate in it, but just participate in facilitating change, will I drown? And will that maybe lead me to a path of having to participate in it again? And I've had experiences in the past that have told me to really just move away from it and stay away. But it's difficult because I do want to help in some way. I've had some really positive experiences and I've been really lucky to come this far. And I'm hoping to go much further. But will going back to help in some way prevent the possibilities of going further and would it be more beneficial and valuable to go further and then look back or go further and never look back or in going further might I be able to meet other beings who see things in these ways and reaffirm the dialogue I've had my, with myself and I'm moving towards maybe one day I will just be talking in spiritual circles and the whole mental health journey element of it will be just a small thing and maybe speaking from that vantage point is more valuable. I really don't know. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about possibilities. I'm talking about things I know nothing about. I'm talking about the unfoldment of something and I don't know what that's going to look like. But again, I have to remind myself to be with what I actually can influence. And my main thing with my self-dialogue is I really can only influence myself. And, and that's why I'm talking to myself in the way that I would like to. And not assuming that anyone else would like to talk in this way. 
because I've had those experiences where people are talking and talking and they sort of assume that another person's interested and they just go on and on and, and they speak in such a way that almost is telling the person, okay, wait, I have something really long to say and the way I'm breathing and the way I'm speaking shows that it's going to be a certain length and I'm just assuming you want to listen to this. When I find usually when I speak to people now, I just give short snippets because I never assume somebody wants to actually hear what I want to say. And I wonder sometimes what makes people say things that they say and where does it come from and why do people think they're interested, that other person's interested. So me talking to myself is I'm never assuming anybody else is ever going to be interested in any of this. And if someone is and they come across it in some way then great but if not and someone can just turn it off or they never come across it whatever it doesn't matter so I'm interested in this conversation with myself and that's why it's gone on so long and I have a lot to say and this actually removes that thing where I feel like I have stuff to say but other people might not be interested in listening and it's probably and it could be a common feeling amongst people who have been labeled with stuff, having a lot to say but nobody to say it to because it's sort of outside the circle of what people are concerned about or interested in in society because a lot of it is about entertainment or what's on TV or blah blah blah. It's just, it's not something that is in this unknown dimension and really exploring and unfolding the unknown. And I was wondering if that's one of the reasons why I'm having a harder time conversing with people because what I want to talk about is just not really part of what comes up naturally. So it's not like, oh, I can add to that. So if I was somebody who watched a lot of TV and someone started talking about TV, I could add to that. But people don't really bring up the things that I have in my heart and mind. And... Some of the things are things I might talk about with a therapist, but I can't afford daily therapy and I probably wouldn't want to. So this process of self-dialogue, again, is kind of a little bit like something I've chosen as part of, of self-direction. And like I said, I've been really self-directing for the last year and, and now that I'm off medication, I don't remember if I said that it's like this other level besides being free from feeling like I need to be near a hospital that I can go to at home in my country where it's provided by healthcare because I feel like if something happens I can manage. I feel a new freedom now that I'm not taking the meds because with meds I need a prescription. So I need to go see a doctor at least every month or two or three in order to get a prescription. So in that way, I'm sort of tethered to that. With the Hardy Nutritionals, I can order that to anywhere in the world. So now it's no longer going to a doctor and, and getting lithium blood tests and getting a prescription for lithium and then going to pick it up at the pharmacy. That's kind of degrading in a way. And, and now I don't have to participate with that, at least for the time being. I'm never saying that this is gonna go on forever though I would like to talk about it like that's a possibility. So yeah, another level of freedom, feeling like maybe I never have to go back to a psychiatrist. Yes, I would rather pay for micronutrients than get free pharmaceuticals because I live in poverty, so I qualify for it them being paid for. So to continue with this self-direction that I've been doing without the funding, and I don't need the funding for self-direction. I can direct myself without having the funding. And so really, for me, self-direction is embodying my mania or moving towards that which I truly would like. And I've already done that in terms of going to California, stopping medication, at least for now. So really, this next phase is unknown in going back home. And after the June 20th anniversary, I kind of would like to consider this embodiment more and what I need to embody to really be 
very solid and unaffected when I go back home. Unaffected by how people might perceive me if I tell them I went off meds or if I don't tell them I went off meds. Or how do I need to be so the question never even comes up? Can I orient my energy in such a way that the question never comes up? I don't know. These are all things that I'm really wondering about. And the other thing is self-direction is more about goals and external things in a way. Like, I want a yoga pass. I want a better place to live so it's not scary. And I want to get a job. Or I want vitamins or something. And these are sort of external things. But embodying one's mania is more the internal orientation of, of of energy and what kind of action that produces. Because in mania, the orientation of energy, the flow of energy changes and our actions and how we are in the world changes and for a certain period of time at least we feel in a very rich dimension of existence. And if we felt connected with that rich dimension of existence, then what we might actually have as goals and and values and things that we want externally might change. Our needs might change drastically. So we could go about it by doing external things and having goals and, and wanting certain items to make our life better through this self-directed funding if it ever comes into play or even without the funding and finding creative ways to to be able to, to do those things and achieve those external goals. but. Really, the the goal, if there is one, in embodying one's mania is that internal orientation of energy that makes each moment so rich, it doesn't really matter what's there. It's really moving and flowing with the moment. So I'm seeing now, talking to myself, that self-direction is sort of a bit more external, though not totally, because one can can go to a certain education program and, and learn certain skills that changes the inner orientation of energy, say say taking improv or or different things that will change that energy of action and, and behavior and improve what they call self-esteem and, and confidence and all those things. That Those are concepts that sort of disappear when one is connected with that embodied mania state. And I'm not talking about being completely manic and out of control but to me I feel like we can master those energies and be in touch with that energy without actually being out of control and actually moving and sharing those energies and, and acting in ways that those energies create us to act because there's some kind of possibility and alignment there there's some kind of intelligence there that if we can really observe it and witness it we may be able to master. And I had a conversation with somebody yesterday and they actually used the word mastery. So again, it could be mastering one's mania as well as embodying one's mania. That could be the same thing. So yeah, the embodiment is more about acting in a certain way, acting in these altruistic ways and, and being in connection with these other values that come in to operation and when that happens one feels like one can do anything and accomplish anything and so that would make the self-direction if there was any a lot easier and it could be important for them to be somewhat congruent with those energies instead of using self-directed funding to move a person back to how they were before when this energy is trying to create some kind of mutation or transformation or metamorphosis or change in us. So what I'm saying is is still harvesting one's mania and really considering that before before wondering what one's goals might be. Because what one's goals were before all the process and, and distress and crisis happen could actually be very different after the fact. And so considering that contrast is important and considering goals not to really get one to the pre-mania state, but to some kind of 
post mania transformation and actually riding the waves of some of those energies because for a lot of us those energies are going to come back so learning to ride the waves of them and master them could be very beneficial and could actually be part of what is trying to move us towards creating the life that we really want so having goals in alignment with that and by having a goal of going to california i didn't know that i would have to master some energies and and ride the waves of certain energies which would lead me to see that i need to come off medication now so by living my dream i got to live another dream which is coming off medication so that's the power of following one's dreams and i even said that the universe could have created that energetic earthquake in my consciousness to make me really see okay i have to come off my meds now because i was in a place where i could do it so things seem to fall in alignment so yeah embodied mania getting in alignment with synchronicity and moving towards synergy because there's signs which are just sort of little coincidences then there's synchronicity which actually require action not just noticing oh that was kind of interesting but action and then synergy i feel is when more than one person are, is involved and and really moving together and sharing that so my real goal is to continue this language creation and recontextualizing and and seeing how just talking with myself unfolds things that that want to unfold and even having this dialogue with myself I never planned to really keep doing it per se but it just kept going so there's some kind of alignment there and I even feel things that I've written I just want to really translate most things into video right now because I feel that is what is most in alignment and putting energy into having a dialogue with myself first and maybe going back and talking about a lot of things that I researched before because there's a lot of good information but I just find it easier to just talk to myself about because it's more fluid than trying to put together some kind of coherent writing. Writing has to be a lot more concise, coherent, um, in a certain order and logical, whereas conversation is just conversation. And my brain does not work on putting things in logical order. By the time I have one point and the next point, I don't even remember what I wrote for the first point, my brain literally cannot do it. And I wonder if self-direction could demand respite, because there's this law that was passed in the States saying that a person has to be in the least invasive treatment facility or something available. So if somebody can be in the community and they're locked up in a, an institution, they have to be in the community. So the community has to provide space for that person. So in the same way, if there's respite as a model and it's less invasive than the hospital and it actually works, then that should be available too. It should be the least invasive treatment too, even in acute care. Not just when, not just when one is already drugged up and somewhat consistent from that and then put them in a community. Well, it should be least invasive too in acute. So I wrote a bunch of stuff down. Self-dialogue is talking about self-direction without support. And maybe one day we can include the system in our conversation. So I'm sure so many of us have already been self-directing in so many ways, just using our own money or, or doing things that are free. And the system only supports this small little chunk, which is take your drugs, take your little bit of rec therapy, this program, that program, that's it. So really the system is asking to be involved in our whole life planning and what makes them think they really deserve to know that kind of stuff? And what makes them think that we're going to be all of a sudden so happy to really collaborate in that way? I guess part of it is the fact that we would get some money. 
Otherwise, we would just, why would we even talk to them? We already don't talk about that stuff because they can't really facilitate that anyway. So what I'm saying is self-dialogue is a way to be the broker of oneself, to be the therapist of oneself. In the last year, I've been my own clinician. I've been my own pharmacist. I've been my own psychiatrist. I've been... I've been my own hospital, yeah, I've been my own pharmacist, splitting my pills in half, tapering myself off, I've been my own psychiatrist, I've been everything for myself. And I wonder if we can create a self-directed mental health peer network, so a network of people that are peer approved, so we don't end up getting directed into things that are not lived experience approved. Screw this evidence-based crap. If you take the evidence-based stuff out there, it's probably 1% or less. And all of these things that we would design for ourselves in self-direction aren't necessarily evidence-based for mental health treatment. But now all of a sudden we would be getting funding for those things. So what I'm saying is, if we have some kind of clinical team involved in our planning, they can still skew us towards using services that if we had a better depth of understanding of what's really out there and we were sharing with each other and having it lived experience approved instead of evidence-based practice, then that would be a lot more rich and helpful for all of us. So perhaps we can do that. Maybe we can even create a Go Fund My Self Direction site. But it would be good to call it something else. But it could be good to call it self direction because if that term becomes more popular within the mental health framework, so it's being Googled and researched, that way when peers hear about it and they Google it, maybe there'll be just as much information put together by peers and people with lived experience than than the system because that could still be designed in kind of a coercive way so self-direction is about creating our own life and perhaps not using their language and can we share with each other how we self-direct before the self-directed funding comes in and i'm wondering if anyone wants to join me in this dialogue i've heard of peer open dialogue in terms of Helping people who might be in altered states of consciousness. But what about having open dialogue about thriving? About, about really changing our lives and, and moving with some of these energies. And, and not just about when things are bad, we have dialogue. But can we dialogue and create new context and language? Like I've been doing with myself and... And maybe all of this dialogue with myself will invite that and it doesn't really matter what I said to myself at all. What matters is inviting a new type of conversation, a new way of seeing ourselves and seeing this process that we go through. And a better word for self-direction instead of self-direction could be self-creation. So direction sounds like, okay, I want to do this, and so I'm really going to focus on that. Whereas creation is more this unfolding, ongoing creative process. And, and each unfoldment, each small step informs the next. So that's the one thing that's kind of lame about goal setting, is that the goal of goal setting is to achieve one's goals. When if one is just creating... And, and designing one's life moment by moment, there's no, oh, you didn't reach your goal. Because if we have our eyes too focused on goals, we're going to miss out on other information that is coming to us. And that could be happening in regular state of consciousness. Everyone has their goals and their desires and their pleasures and what they're really looking for. And what they really would resonate with is actually all around, but it can't be seen because of goals and because of focus. It's actually a space of loosening up one's focus and sort of blurring one's eyes and allowing the focal vision to really take a rest and 
not having these goals as words coming out of one's eyes and chopping up reality, but just really taking reality in and seeing what it's bringing to us. And I made a note about that somewhere, but I don't know where it is yet. And another point is with this, is that altered states can be temporary and transient and they don't necessarily require daily medications but we've been hypnotized into thinking we do but if we can be our own modulator of our consciousness decide when we need to take what and when we don't need to take anything and maybe take nothing most of the time but if if crap hits the fan then we take something but not take everything thinking that we really have to poison our consciousness daily in order to function in the world because it's not necessarily true. And as we become more confident with some of these things and really learn about these energies, we know when we need to do something to bring them back and we know when we don't need to do anything. And, and so it's even about self-creating or self-directing one's own consciousness. So there's the goals we can do outside and get funding for, but no amount of funding is really going to teach us how to understand our own consciousness. And that's something we have to do for ourselves. And, and some of these medications can be ways of modulating that, but we don't need to down-regulate our whole experience every single day. That's going to actually prevent the learning. So, and I think that one time I talked to myself about the Recovery Declaration of Canada and how one of the points was related to having people with lived experience involved in every level of service, delivering services, service design, blah, blah, blah. But I think with this self-direction point coming in, it actually needs to be hugely revised to say, not just in service delivery, but in directing one's own recovery and life and having funding and support in order to move through all dimensions of life, not just through the system. So having peers involved in creating some kind of map of what we really can explore outside this very small piece of the pie of the services in the mental health system. So that's the thing, recovery right now is recovery through the mental health system and the services they provide. But if self-directed funding came in, that would expand it to something so vast and peers would be involved in that. So it's really something huge instead of this tiny little having peers involved in service delivery and so that's really what I'm doing with myself, is talking about all those other dimensions, though I haven't talked that much about it. It's been more about moving outside, having to participate in the system at all. And that's kind of what I would prefer to work on anyway, is helping people move outside the system completely. But if it was actually a really good system, then maybe people wouldn't want to. So I talk a lot about moving outside the system, but if it really was completely self directed from everything to whether or not someone takes medication to exactly what the amount one would get if one is slapped with a label. It can go to anything one feels that one would need to regain a quality of life that at some point becomes a self-sustaining positive feedback loop. And that's what thriving is. It's being in this self-sustaining positive feedback loop, which with the way the current system is designed, it's very difficult to make that happen. And I'm somewhat making that happen for myself, but by moving away from what the system offers and what the system would tell me to do. And maybe one day the system won't tell anyone what to do. And one can really design their own path to a positive feedback thriving loop and maybe it would be a certain way in the beginning like needing basic needs and they talked about that in the webinar people with the funding initially meet basic needs but eventually as a person gains confidence and skills and energy that energy and all of that good stuff inside can actually be utilized in order to further use the funding in 
more expansive ways. So yeah, the recovery declaration should really say something about uh, we have the right to say exactly what that process looks for us and change it and be creative in the process and, and have it be fluid and have the funding and support to back that up. And it's not just taking the money and saying thank you. It's actually if we're able to move into a place of being where we are happy and fulfilled, that has implications for all areas of society and saves money for society in every area, not just mental health spending. So, and they talked about that in the webinar too, and they haven't done any studies particularly on that yet, but it's pretty obvious in, in what they've discovered so far. I can see that with self-directed funding, people might really be able to transcend the mental health system for real, even if it is a good one with self-direction. I have a lot more to talk about with myself. I have some notes in my computer. I have those things I want to read other things I want to talk to about some of my past experience that point to why I never dreamed it had anything to do with mental health issues and they're kind of cool things and I'll probably touch on them as I go it would be cool to revisit them and actually just frame them in the way that I felt that they were at the time without referencing anything to do with mental health and soon I won't even have to say without referencing anything to do with mental health. So I'm pretty excited about certain things just falling out of this dialogue and not taking up any more of my energy in it arising and, and being given voice to through my voice and then listening to myself saying it later and blah 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 blah. So could be kind of cool.